All right, welcome everyone. You guys are attending a, a virtual hearing of the Board of Municipal and Zoning Appeals zoning docket for Tuesday, May 18th. Um, my name is Katie Byrne. I'm the Acting Executive Director. And before I turn it over to the chair, just a few housekeeping duties. If you are testifying today, it is assumed that you are testifying under oath, that you will be testifying the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Um, you have signed in via the internet, and you're considered an attendee. So right now, you do not have the ability to mute or unmute yourself. When your case is called, I will elevate you to a panelist, and you'll be able to speak. And if you have the option to turn your camera on, you may turn your camera on. You can also share information. Um, uh, as a presenter. Anyone who calls in and wishes to testify, you will hear two beeps when you are unmuted. If you hear those two beeps and it's the case that you wish to testify on, please speak up. So um, if you do not speak up, I will move on to the next caller. If you're unable to connect to audio, um, please use the chat feature if you have a question or if your speaker, if the speaker is inaudible, you'll be directed to call back. There are two ways that you can testify in support or opposition of a matter. You have a chat feature, so you can put a question into the chat or you can say, I would like to testify on case number 2021-001. You can also raise your hand. There's a raise hand function, and I'll be able to, to get you in order to testify. The order of testimony is as follows. The applicant goes first, any support for the application second, then opposition, and then the applicant gets the last word, and then testimony closes. Anyone speaking on a matter before this board, again, is required to speak the whole truth and nothing but the truth. If you have any issues with WebEx or connecting, please call our office at 410-396-4301. If you're having technical difficulties and can't participate for any reason, please email us at bmza at baltimorecity.gov. All right, so our order of events, we have four board members for today's hearing. The cases will be called by the chair and we may proceed through the entire, and we will proceed through the entire docket. Your case may not be called in the order in which it appears on the agenda. At the conclusion of the hearing, the chair will close testimony and the board will deliberate. No further testimony will be taken and no further comments are permitted. Thanks everyone. And I'll turn it over to our chair, Mr. Fields. Thank you, Ms. Leonard. Uh, again, some preliminary uh, ground rules. Uh, the board will vote on each case and make a decision at the end of the docket, unless, of course, there is some issue that either we need more information on or a presentation for uh, or documents to review. Uh, generally, as a general matter, however, we will decide on the matter at the end of the docket. Uh, you may feel free to stay on the line to uh, listen in to that and observe that deliberation. Uh, but of course, you cannot participate at that point. Um, otherwise, you can just simply feel free to call the BMZA BMZA office tomorrow after 9 a.m. The number is 410-396-4301 and 410-396-4301. In any event, you could receive your resolution in the mail within approximately 30 days. We ask that you not do any work until your resolution is received. And certainly, don't do any work in Baltimore City without pulling the proper permits. We do have a couple of matters that are postponed, postponed or withdrawn uh, from today's docket. We're participating uh, or expected to participate on these matters. Uh, they will not be heard today. Uh, case number 2021-039, 701 through 5707 Newberry Street. Uh, appellant there at Sprouting Scholars, care of Shauna Watson. Again, case number 2021-039. 5701 through 5707 Newberry Street. The matter has been withdrawn. Uh, case number 2021 that's 041 6465 Frankfurt Avenue. Uh, again, 2021 that's 041 6465 Frankfurt Avenue. The matter has been postponed. Uh, finally, case number 2021 045 205 South Chapel Street. The applicant there is Eden No. 
case number 2021-045-205 South Chapel Street. Matter has been postponed. James, if I could, one more housekeeping duty that I forgot to announce. The next docket, which is June 1st, um, Charm TV will not be carrying that live. So if you wish to participate or watch live, you'll have to sign in for WebEx. It will be the record. It will be recorded and available for review later, but it will not be carried live on June 1st. Thank you. Uh, we then have a, a fairly extensive consent docket. Uh, but before we get to that matter, there's one other matter I want to call and uh, Ms. Byrne, maybe we can address this one. Case number sure. 2021-051-1000 West Cross Street. The appellant there is Carballo Architecture, care of Neil Curtis. Yes, let me find Mr. Carballo. Just there you are. All right, Adam, I've just elevated you as a panelist and we're going to discuss 1000 West Cross Street. So as Mr. French just stated, um, the building itself was demolished and the request is to conditional use neighborhood commercial establishment, um, retail store, no alcoholic beverage sales. I was able to look in permits and see that there was an emergency demolition that the owner was required um, by DHCD and the fire department to demolish the structure. And neighborhood commercial establishment is defined in the zoning code means a non-residential use that is within a residential or office residential zoning district, but in a structure that is non-residential in its construction and original use or has received prior zoning approval for a non-residential use as evidenced by permits construction or historical evidence of lawful of a lawful non-residential use and the history for this lot was that it had a lawful non-residential use before um, so I think that the staff or the BMVA just reviewing our staff report while Mr. French is concerned because the building is gone. I think it's a harsh reality for someone who was forced to demolish their structure when they had an active permit for a non-residential use. Yeah, I'd, I'd concur. Um, it, do, do you mind if I quickly share uh, a couple of photos of this prop property? Is that... Yeah, feel free. Um, I could get the ability to oh, share. I need to pass you the ball. Hold on, Adam. Sorry. <laughs> Let me pass the ball. <laughs> there you are. Yes. All right. Great. Um, so as you can see, this is the existing structure. And uh, this building, um, the owner, the current owner purchased this building um, very shortly before the building actually collapsed. It wasn't necessarily a demo that the building just collapsed in, in you know, it, 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 uh, one, uh, I think one early morning. And as you can see, it's sort of, then we uh, got an emergency demo order to remove the remaining portions, but we had, you know, fully intended on trying to restore this building. And, you know, this was a, a sort of a corner carryout for, for decades. Um, so obviously legally. Um, Adam, legally, can I ask you a question? Did you keep the yes, foundation? Did you keep the foundation? Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay, so the foundation of the building is still intact. That is correct. Yes, around the perimeter. And yes, our, right. Yeah, and I mean, this it, it's sort of a uh, an unusual shaped lot. It's a triangular lot. And our goal is to have, um, uh, re really the issue before the board is the rear yard setback. There is really no rear yard. Um, we're basically putting back the same footprint. And the owner would actually like to, there was there was a ground floor retail with two dwelling units above the owner of the property would like to use a ground floor retail space and a single dwelling unit that he would actually like to occupy himself on the upper two floors um so that's really where we are um, you're going back with the same you're proposing to go back with the same footprint as the foundation is today the original uh, yes, foundation was. yes sir uh, we we are in we are infilling a portion on the on the third floor, 
but the actual footprint, uh, it was it was nearly a you know, 99% lock coverage. We do have a small portion here that we've receded back, a place to put trash cans, um, you know, just so that they're they're sort of out of the way. Um, but uh, effectively, a you know, 95, 98% lock coverage, just like the previous building. Okay. Um, Bern, I think uh, what you read in terms of the, the code portion that you read, sort of that additional factual information, I think helps satisfy and establishes that every part of this building is not new. Certainly the foundation is not new. Um, Correct. It pre-existed. Uh, and the foundation is part of a structure, so. Correct. Okay. Uh, all right, well. Um, Adam, I'm gonna what, take the what, ball back. Yep. Okay, so uh, Mr. Carballo, hang on because I think we'll just make him the first and then case then. Okay. Uh, and the little preamble for the consent cases for our listening and viewing audience. Um, consent cases are matters for which the board uh, believes it has sufficient information to approve the applicant's uh, appeal. Uh, so, in those circumstances, uh, they simply want to be sure the records complete uh, and give the applicant an opportunity to add anything uh, he or she or an entity wants to add to be sure the record is complete that falls at the purpose of that appeal will be granted. Um, and so we have a series of them today. Uh, we'll start with uh, the case we just called, case number 2021-051, 1000 West Cross Street, uh, Carballo Architecture Care of Neil Curtis is a request to construct a three-story structure with basement with rooftop deck that will contain neighborhood commercial establishment. And uh, we just saw photos of that. Um, uh, we have the background uh, from uh, staff, what Ms. Byrne uh, provided earlier. Um, and we could also hear from you again, Mr. French, if you'd like to weigh in uh, for a planning report. Thank you. Martin French for the Baltimore City Planning Department. Planning department notes that there is another item in the zoning code, which is sec subsection 14-328A, which starts out, because neighborhood commercial establishment uses apply only to certain already existing structures, those uses are not subject to minimum lot area. So if the board finds that this is an already existing structure, the department has no objection to approval of this application. Thank you so much, Mr. French, appreciate it. Um, uh, Ms. Byrne, do you want to be heard for a staff report or are you good with where we are on the record? Um, I think we're good with where we are on the record. Mr. Carballo basically identified the things that we had in the staff report and the fact that there was the foundation still existed. That means that the structure itself is technically still there under at least as you would review it under the building code, that there's still an element of the structure that's still there. Very well. Uh, and I'll turn to you, Mr. Gabalo, and ask you, uh, is there anything that uh, you'd like to add to your application at this time? Uh, no, sir. Very well. And the board, having heard your appeal, we believe we have sufficient information to approve it. Thanks so much. Thank you. And now I'll start at the top of the list with the other consent cases, calling case number 2021-014, 1815 Marshall Street. Uh, the appellant is Josh Nicodemus. And this is a request to subdivide the lot and develop three four-story single-family row homes with front-loading garages. Is there any right. staff and or planning report? Um, staff report, it, uh, the variance to lot coverage is they're seeking um, greater than 99% is proposed. The minimum rear yard setback, it's they're proposing a three foot rear yard setback and the conditional use for the building height of up to 45 feet, which is allowed for interior row house adjoining a right of way of less than 30 feet wide. The 39 feet high is what is proposed. Um, the board has the ability to grant all of the requested relief. So let me find uh, Mr. Nicodemus. Anything from planning on this, Mr. French? Not officially. However, this is a subdivision, and therefore the planning commission will have to review and approve the subdivision plan and the development plan for this property. Thank you. Very well. Thank you. All right. 
If you are here for 1815 Marshall Street, please raise your hand or um, identify yourself in the chat. Because I do not see Josh Nicodemus in the attendees. Simon, if you wouldn't mind checking with me, I'll go through the call in users now. Again, as I unmute you, if you hear two beeps, please speak if you are here for 1815 Marshall. Oh, I'm afraid we don't have anyone here for 1815 Marshall that I can tell. Um, nothing in the chat, no hands raised. Maybe we can recall this. Hopefully, sure, you'll sure. be able to get on. Sure, we'll Great. go on and so, uh, circle back on that one a little later. Uh, calling the next case on the consent docket 2021 040 308 North Cary Street. Uh, the appellant here is Black Star Management LLC, care of Justin William Butler. Uh, this is a request to use the premises as a multifamily dwelling that will consist of six dwelling units. I'll hear any uh, reports from staff uh, in their planning. Yeah, James, would, would you, oh, if you sorry. wouldn't mind calling yeah. um, the next let me, let me go ahead and do that. Sorry, okay. so we got case number 2021-040-308 North Cary. Case number 2021-042-310 North Cary. And case number 2021-043-312 North Cary Street. All with the same applicant. And all, of course, and collectively to use multifamily dwelling that will consist of six dwelling units. So 308, 310, and 312 North Cary Street. Okay. Uh, for uh, Mr. French, would you like to go first? Thank you. <laughs> Don't mind it. Uh, yes. Uh, planning department has reviewed all three of these applications notes the community is supportive of these applications uh, because they will return vacant buildings to active residential use. These properties are in the Southwest Partnership Revitalization Area, Southwest Impact Investment Area, and very close to Franklin Square Park. The department has no objection to the application. If the applicant provides the board information establishing that variance is needed for approval, comply with standards for approval of a variance as specified in subsection 5-308A of the zoning code. And that applies to all three of these. Um, staff report, uh, very similar to what Mr. French just stated, the variances requested are relief from minimal lot area um, and off-street parking. Six spaces are required, two are proposed, and there are two letters in support for all three properties, one from Franklin Square Community Association and the other from the um, Southwest Partnership, both associations in support of the project. And I have elevated Mr. Williams as a panelist. Um, Very well. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Williams. Thanks, good afternoon. Um, for the record, Justin Williams from the law firm <clears throat> Rosenberg Martin Greenberg. I'm joined virtually, I believe, by Kwame Mills, the uh, principal from Black Star Management. Um, just to quickly address Mr. French's um, condition, um, as usual, we'll present, we'll provide the staff with a thick packet of uh, exhibits and materials to support our relief. But to run the board through it, and actually, if Ms. Byrne, could you share the fall? Certainly. And I've, I've elevated Ms. Um, Kwame Mills as a panelist in case, you know, you wish to call him to testify. Thank you. Uh, the subject <laughs> properties are seen in this area here on North Cary Street. They are one of the big old row homes that were built in the late, um, I guess, 19th century, um, and their style was that the front of the homes were built for the, the wealthy homeowner and the rear was built for the servants, where they would come like from the servant quarters and serve the, um, the owners of the home. 
Um, and so that's the uniqueness that drives the need for our relief here. Um, this was a similar case the board heard, maybe Mr. Bonaventure um, in his tenure at the time um, remembers this. This was a block south at the 200 block of North Cary Street, similar, actually exactly the same style homes. Annotations. Weird. Sorry, these annotations. But um, <laughs> either way, uh, where the same situation occurred where the, the rear of the property uh, was shorter and different height a different floor plate than the front of the property. And so that caused a unique issue where going across the property would have caused um, a unique hardship on the uh, applicant and developer to refurbish the buildings for three units. And there the board uh, granted approval for six units. That's the same circumstance here where the design of the buildings drives the need for the relief. And in light of the uh, community support, we uh, asked the board to approve. Uh, very well. Um, again, you are on the consent docket, but if there's anything else you'd like to add uh, to make the record complete, uh, you can feel free to do so, Williams. If there's any, anybody uh, else you need to call? Nothing further. Okay, great. Uh, well, uh, the board appreciates your presentation and can tell you that the uh, board, having heard your appeal, we believe we have sufficient information to approve you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, moving on, um, next uh, case on the consent docket, case number 2021-046, 137 North Belnord Avenue. Uh, the applicant is Abraham Michon. Uh, this is a request to use the ground floor as restaurant and market. I don't hear any staff reports or planning reports you may have. Um, I do not believe Mr. French has a um, report on this one. And this is essentially a conditional use neighborhood, a commercial establishment. Um, DHCD indicates that the property has been used uh, in the past as a tavern. And this goes back to, I believe, the 90s. Um, so this is, they want to use the ground floor as a restaurant and market. And um, the board has the ability to grant this neighborhood commercial establishment. And I will actually, for the record, go ahead. The planning Mr. department has reviewed this and has no objection. Thank you, Mr. Frank. Mr. Michon. One moment. There we go, <clears throat> Mr. Michon. Sir, I've made you a panelist. Abraham Michon. Uh, let me see. I, let me see. I probably and you're unmuted, sir. You can speak. Good afternoon. This is Abraham. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Uh, welcome to the BMZA. Uh, so we have you here with the request uh, to use the ground floor as a restaurant and market. Um, can you do you, can you tell us uh, what hours you plan to operate your restaurant and market? The plan is to bring. Uh, to bring a food and vibe to the, that community. So the plan we're gonna run start from 11 to 10 p.m. From 11 a.m. to 10 p.m. 11 a.m. to 10 p.m. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to tell us uh, for the record? No. Sir. Uh, well, the board, having heard your appeal, we believe we have sufficient information to approve your appeal. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you and good luck. All right, thank you. Uh, my peer is uh, Just wanted to know when he was operated. Okay. Uh, next case on the consent docket, case number 2021-047, 3729 through 3735 Ross Street. Uh, the applicant is Black Acres Roastery LLC, care of Travis Bell. And this is a request to use a uh, portion of the premises known as tenant space one and two as coffee shop and restaurant with on premises coffee roasting, outdoor seating uh, on private property, catering, and liquor license. I'll hear any reports you may have. For um... Let's see. The variance is again for this one is conditional use neighborhood commercial establishment, retail goods, and restaurant. 
the prior research on this shows that there was a the board approved a conditional use back in 2019 for first floor office second floor as one dwelling unit with accessory off street parking the is one letter of support here for this application from the highland town community association um, supporting the black acres rotisserie uh coffee bar and road Let's see. Um, so wholly support that from Highland Town Community Association. And Mr. French, um, did planning have, a, I don't think you all had a report on this? We had, well, we did. Uh, the planning department is recommending approval of the application. We did review it. Okay. Right. I do have a question regarding the liquor license was burned and we have any issue with regard to that the well they could the not board? have um let's see they could do if they have a liquor license associated with their catering business that's different than a liquor sale outside of the commercial establishment so if they have if they have a liquor license associated with the catering that's different than having a liquor license for service at uh, on premises so they don't have the ability to do liquor sales in a neighborhood commercial establishment all right okay all right very well let um, me so let me get the josh mente i believe is the applicant here All right, so if you are here for this particular appeal for um, Gulf Street, if you could please raise your hand. Nate, is that, are you here for Gulf Street? No. Matt Nierenberg, all right, here we go. Mr. Nierenberg, thank you for raising your hand. All right, you are unmuted, sir, I believe. Hi, how are you today? Uh, good afternoon, um, Mr. Nierenberg. Uh, so we're here and you're here on the consent docket, uh, but I want to confirm, uh, is the intent to uh, have the liquor license attached to the catering business only? Uh, I believe that is correct. Um, I am the business partner of Travis Bell. I knew he planned on signing in today. Um, I'm not sure if he's here as well. He is, he is. I'll elevate Mr. Bell. Okay. All right, Mr. Bell. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Bell. Um, and I'll just uh, pose to you what I just posed to Mr. Nierenberg. Mr. Nierenberg, uh, that the uh, liquor license is attached to the catering business only? Uh, yes, that, that was the intention of the liquor license, to be able okay. to do the event side of the space and um, you know, host those in the evening time. Yeah. Okay. Uh, very well. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to add to your application this time? Right. Yeah, so we look to operate the business from um, 7 a.m. to uh, 3 p.m. Monday through Friday and have uh, weekend hours of 9 to 3 p.m. Um, we plan to do trash removal on Mondays after weekend services. Um, we will have a couple parking spots available in our uh, private lot property. Um, and we also will have outdoor seating available for patrons that come in. Um, and then uh, we understand we're not able to do live music, but we plan to have speakers available in the in the parking lot as well and in, in the space we utilize for, for music purposes. All right. Well, very well. Thank you for that additional information. Um, I can tell you that the board having heard your appeal, we believe we have sufficient information to approve this. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. All right, that'll conclude matter 2021-051. Our next case on the consent docket, case number 2021-053, 35 North Potomac Street. The applicant is Bertina McCline, and this is a request to use the ground floor as a neighborhood commercial establishment, uh, a coffee shop. Are there any reports? Mr. French, would you like to go? Thank you. Planning department has reviewed this application and is recommending approval.
Again, history of this particular property in 2014, the board approved the use as a restaurant and carry out. Property was used as a tavern in the 1990s. Um, let's see, and neighborhood commercial establishments under 2,500 square feet are exempt from off street parking. This fits the category of a conditional use neighborhood commercial establishment coffee shop. And Ms. McCline is the applicant. Let's see if I have her here. There she is. Uh, Ms. McCline, I'm unmuting you. You should be able to speak. Hello. Uh, yes, good afternoon, ma'am. Hi, um, good afternoon, panel. Uh, so we're here on the consent docket, uh, today's BMZA docket for 35 North Potomac Street. Uh, and uh, I'd like to ask you if there's anything you'd like to add to your application at this time. Um, just the hours of um, operation, which is Monday through Friday from 8 to 9 p.m. and on Saturdays from 10 to 7. Okay, great. I, uh, I got go ahead, ma'am. Um, also, we, that's just, that's it. Okay. Well, again, we appreciate that additional information. Uh, and we're happy to tell you that the board, having heard your appeal, we believe you have sufficient information to approve your appeal. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. All right. Good luck to you. Uh, moving on, calling case number 2021-054-612 Cathedral Street. Uh, the applicant here is SMNP Architects, care of Adam Tawney. This is a request to install two additional projecting wall signs. And I'll hear any uh, reports we may have from staff and our planning. Mr. French? The planning department reviewed this application, noted that this property is located in the Mount Vernon district, which is a local historic district. The applicant has been working with uh, CHAP staff on obtaining an authorization to proceed. And in fact, uh, CHAP staff is prepared to issue the authorization to proceed if the board should approve this application. The department therefore recommends approval of this application be subject to the condition that the signs are installed and maintained in accordance with an authorization to proceed issued by the Commission for Historical and Architectural Preservation. Thank you, Mr. French. Pursuant to staff report, again, this is um, in a C2 zoning district, one sign is permitted. Uh, they're requesting two additionally proposed projecting wall signs, which is why it's here before the board. There is a letter of support from the Mount Vernon Place Conservancy, um, and they're supporting the request of the applicant. And the applicant is M SMMP Architects. Let's see if I can find them here. Ariana Guru. Ariana. Let's see. Don't seem to be able, doesn't appear that you have a microphone. Um, let me see if I can put you back down as a attendee and unmute you. Huh. All right, I'm gonna make you a panelist. Um, but I don't seem to have the ability to unmute you for whatever reason. Uh, is there anything that you'd like to add? If you could put it in the chat or if you're calling, I'll go through, if you're calling in, I can go through the call end users. Let's try that. All right, I see you running in 2980. Hello? Oops, that's you. Uh, Ariana? Ariana? Ariana, is that you? Me? Let's try the Can next you hear me? One. Yes. Great. Um, nothing, nothing much to add, um, but we are indeed um, requesting to have two new blade signs installed on the east facade of the newly, well, soon to be newly renovated, renovated um, facade of the Hotel Revival. 
and uh, we have support from the Mount Vernon Place Conservancy and some and verbal support from uh, the Mount Vernon Belvedere Association. Just no letter at this time. Okay. Uh, very well. Uh, well, Ms. Uh, <laughs> I want to say uh, thank you, uh, board. Uh, having uh, heard your appeal, we believe we have sufficient information to approve your appeal. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next case on the consent docket: case number twenty twenty one dash zero six four two zero four South Augusta Avenue. Helen is Edward Laud. Uh, this is a request to use the premises for three dwelling units and associated variances. Uh, we'll hear from staff and their planning. All right. Um, we have one letter of support for this one to use the premises for three dwelling units and associated variances. Um, need a minimum lot area variance as well as off street parking. Um, they're need a variance to the three required there are none proposed in 2008 the board granted the use as three dwelling units um and the use and occupancy was never finalized by the prior owner and they had some failed fire and housing inspections in 2017 which is more than likely why uh, they're back because the use and occupancy didn't necessarily cross the finish line, but the board did grant this use back in 2008. Um, Mr. French, did planning have any comment on this one? Planning department has no comment on this. Okay, and I've elevated Mr. Glaud to a presenter and uh, Mr. Glaud, I just unmuted you, sir. Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Glaud. Good, good. Um, I'm trying to. Oh, there we go. We got the video there. All right. Sorry, this is my first right. time doing this. No problem. Um, yeah, we nice to meet you every week with this. So. Yeah, <laughs> nice to meet everybody. Um, so this is a long time coming. Uh, we purchased the property back in February. Um, I have a letter from um the neighborhood association in Irvington, which I don't. I shared it. I don't know if everybody has it. We we do have that, sir. So we, I do have that here in the file uh, board. So we have a letter in support from the Irvington Community Association um, for the proposed use for three dwelling units. Okay, perfect. And I sent in all the, the pictures and everything. Um, the next step now is, I mean, the place is already set up for three units. Um, and when we bought it, we, we had no clue that anything expired or any of that kind of stuff. So um, when we went to, um, to upgrade the electric, um, we noticed that we, you know, we couldn't go any further because of the current status. So um, I had to put the whole project on hold and um, we're going to put the meters on the outside on the meter stack and do everything the right way. And um, as soon as that's completed, um, you know, as soon as we pull the permit and the work is completed, um, you know, look to potentially put it there. Excellent. Well, it sounds like a, a great opportunity and uh... A good opportunity for some folks uh, for new housing. So, uh, the board having heard your appeal, Mr. Glaude, we, uh, we have sufficient information to approve your appeal. Thank, Thank you so much. Good luck to you. Appreciate you. Thank you, guys. Right. Uh, moving on, case number 2021 086 6504 Edenvale Road. Uh, this is uh, Presented by AB Associates as the applicant. This is a request to construct a two story addition. I'll hear any uh, reports we may have. Planning department has no comment on this application. Thank you. So, for, for this, it's a rear yard setback, 10 feet are required, 6 feet are proposed. We have a letter of support um, in the file from the actual impacted neighbor next door uh, at 6502, and um, they're in support of the variance to the setback. I've elevated Mr. Cruddle to for AB Associates as a um, panelist. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Ms. Byrne, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, I have nothing further to add at this time. You mentioned the letter of support. so. Unless there's any questions. Okay, uh, well, 
I don't think the board has any questions, uh, but thank you, Mr. Preto. Yeah, thank you. I'll note the uh, letter of uh, support. Um, let you know that the board, having heard your appeal, will you ask sufficient information to approve it? Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. Okay. Uh, I'm going to get back to that first matter that we called. Yes, um, 1815 Marshall, Mr. Nicodemus, I believe he is calling in. So let's okay. let's go through the call in users. So, Mr. Okay. Nicodemus, if you hear two beeps, please speak. And again, for the record, this is case number 2021-014. Okay. Mr. Nic Mr. Nicodemus? Yes, I am uh, I'm present. Okay, great. Is that who we have, Mr. Nick? Yes. All right. That is who we yes. have. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, this is uh, you're on the consent docket here in the BMZA uh, today, um, and your request to subdivide the lot and develop three four-story single-family row homes with front-loading garage. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes, sir. Okay. Is there anything, sir, that you'd like to add to your application at this time? Uh, no, no, nothing we'd like to add at this time. That's, that's pretty much sums it up. Right. Very well. Uh, well, the board, having heard your appeal, we believe we have sufficient information to approve your appeal. Uh, thank you. Wonderful. And thank good you luck very to much. You. All right. Thank you. I appreciate the call, too. Thank you. No thank problem. you. Thank you. Right. All right. Um, now we can turn our attention to the regular docket. We have maybe four matters on the regular docket. So Get started. Uh, case number 2021-021-118 East 24th Street. The appellant is uh, Leon Moretti. Uh, this is a request to use the premises as a multifamily uh, consisting of three dwelling units. You know, here in the court you may have for this property. Mr. French, would you like to go first? Yes, thank you. Uh, planning department has reviewed this application, noted that this property was last authorized as a multifamily dwelling with two dwelling units. <clears throat> the applicant is requesting uh, a third dwelling unit, essentially. The department has no objection to approval of this application. If the applicant provides the board information, establishing the variance is needed for approval, comply with standards for approval of a variance, as specified in subsection 5-308A of the zoning code. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Burns. So the variants requested by the applicant include a uh, minimum lot area variants. Um, the, they're required to have 2,250 square feet, but only 1,275 square feet is available. Their 100% lot coverage is required by this applicant. Minimum rear yard setback, the required is 25 feet, um, but there are seven feet proposed. Expansion of non-conforming structure, the proposed rear Exterior stairs would increase the size of the non-conforming structure, and there's an off-street parking variant. Three are required and are proposed. We have a letter um, from a neighbor in opposition concerned about sanitation with the multifamily and density concerns. Uh, the board um, in the packet in 2018, this board denied an application to use the premises as four dwelling units but the board granted conditional use for three dwelling units in 1959. The vacant building notice was issued to this- How you doing, Hannah? My name is Edwin. Um, may I speak to, I think it's Emily? Oh, I'm not sure oh, where that's coming from. Sounds like Mr. Glock. Um, hold on, it's like 38, 38, 35, Edwin Glott, okay, is he still, is he unmuted? Are you, all right, let me find him. Yep. Mute. Okay, sorry about that. Sorry. I must have missed, missed muting him. Um, okay. okay, so there was a vacant building notice issued to this property in November of 2017, and it has a condemnation sign on it, but related to structural issues that need to be addressed. Um, as I said, the opposition from the neighbor uh, is worried again about sanitation and parking. And I believe the neighbor is on the line, but the applicant, Leon Rogerio, I will make him a panelist. Okay. All right. The applicant is now well, on. Right. Hi. Good, good afternoon. afternoon. Hey, good hey, afternoon. Mr. 
Mr. Ruggiero. Um, yes. So uh, we're here on your uh, application uh, to Correct. use this premises as uh, a multifamily uh, unit consisting of three dwelling units. Uh, tell us about your project, sir. Hey, so um, I acquired the property right back in August, I think, of September. Um, and then I start with, I'm work with Josh and W2 engineers because the property right now, it is a three unit, it has meters for three units, three mailboxes, enough parking lot, an uh, uh, angle parking lot right in front. It is a corner building and also has a two car garage along with the three parking lots or four maybe right in front of the building, right? And then, but then I was hit with big news back in December, November, when we sent for the permit application that apparently because it was vacant for X, Y, Z time, you know, you know everything, everything was very new for me. I had no idea this even existed. Um, I am a general contractor, been working in Baltimore area for 14 years. I have flipped some houses in Cape Town, Cross Street, James Street, and um, my goal is to make the city better, of course. I've been living here for 14 years, like I said. Um, the house does have back entrance, front entrance, emergency exit. The building, I really don't see any issues. Why not? It is a 3,500 square feet building, by the way. I don't see the need of a family, one single family living in such a big space. It is harder to do a lot keep, you know. My goal is to have a, a property management company. Um, and I would like to keep as a three unit. All the plans are ready, by the way. It is already set up as a three unit. Everything is ready to go. All I need is the permit and the work gets started next week. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Ruggiero. No problem. Are there any questions from the board? Did this property, Katie, ever have a multiple dwelling license? Do we know? Um, probably not because it still has that vacant building notice from 2016. Mm -hmm. Multifamily, the, well, actually, you know what? Maybe it did, let me look. Because three dwelling units would have required that. Okay. Yeah, for yeah. three, not it two. Is, it is set up as a three. There was three kitchens when I moved, when I bought it. There was, uh, it is four meters there, which is one for each each unit, and one for the public area, right? Which is the staircases and the garage, I guess. So yeah, the whole setup is for, is for three years off now. Oh, by the way, one thing I want to add up to this, there is no structure issues, by the way. There are braces outside, but the reason so is the previous owner, they did an underpinning on the basement, right? To do a four unit. And the plans was, the plans was ready, they were ready to go, the, everything, money, finances, all that. The city didn't approve, unfortunately. It took almost a year to try to get the four unit variance. And then that's why I think maybe they decided to sell the property, right? So I came in, I said, hey, I'm okay. I'm having three units. I love it. That's what I'm looking for. And then, then thing after thing, you know, and then COVID is seven months waiting. So it, it, it is. <laughs> yeah, just to jump in, it did have a multifamily dwelling license when DHCD was inspecting back 2006, 2008. Um, it looks like there was a multifamily dwelling license at the time. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, and I believe we also have, uh, if there's no more questions for the applicant, we have the op uh, someone in of opposition on the line as well. Sure. Okay. And I also talk with the neighbor, very nice lady. I know her concerns, I get it. I follow up with her like maybe three or four times since last year. We just spoke about two weeks ago. I said, look, we're just waiting for the permit. BMYZ, I'm really sorry about this. I know you guys don't want to be walking here and seeing a vacant building. Trust me, with the best of my ability, I'm trying to do my best, but I cannot, legally, I cannot do any work until the terms are approved. Okay, so hold I just on, want to you know, put that out there. All right, well, going to Bistani on. Hold on, Mr. Ruggiero. My applicants. Lost my attendees for a second. Hold on. Okay. There's Ms. Bondi. Okay, I have two people that wish to testify, it looks like. All right, Ms. Bondi, you're unmuted. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, ma'am. Yes, um, I have lived adjacent to the building for um, more than 16 years, and it has never been a multifamily dwelling 
um, with multifamilies in it. There's no mailboxes outside. There's only one entrance and the entire inside has been gutted at this point. No one's ever used the garage to put cars in and that itself has been demolished. Um, I've never spoken to Mr. Rogerio. I'm not sure if who he's referring to, um, but I knew the owners before the property became vacant and there was only one family living there. Um, there is space in front to park, but not for three cars. And there is no space behind the garage. It's an alley. Um, uh, so there are bricks falling down from the building. There's broken glass and the building has been braced with huge wood braces for over a year now. Do they still exist, ma'am? The braces? Yes. Yes. Yes, and we can't walk on the sidewalk there. There's debris everywhere. Um, we weren't really sure who owned the building at this point. Right. We're, uh, mainly we're concerned with um, where trash will be collected. There's trash that fills up from unknown sources already right after the trash um, department comes on Friday. So with extra people, we're just wondering where their trash will be located. The back of their house is the front of my house. So I have trash in front of my house, um, which I'm constantly picking up. So that's all I have to say. Thank you for listening. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for your participation. Okay. I believe that is the only person who had a hand raised at this moment for this particular application. Uh, so, Mr. Rogerio, did you hear that uh, yes. person speaking? Yes. Uh, like I said, I, I think we've got him. Is it is the building uh, braced right now with uh, support? Um, so, yeah, I have a few things I want to comment through her comments, right? I understand her concerns. Again, I'm the new buyer. I had no idea from before. So my goal is to actually get it done. Um, the braces are there, but again, there is no structure issues. The reason is so. Any W2 engineer said they just want to wait for the permit to be approved. They don't want to double check something, and then we can remove it. But all the joists inside, everything is ready to go. The braces are actually ready to be moved. Almost just need this permit to be approved. Uh, about the debris, last week I did clean it. Okay, the city did call me. It was like three or four bricks that fall down. Which is normal, you know, the house, but they're vacant. Um, they, I believe that was fixed. Uh, we clean all the trash inside the property. We have to work there for four or five days last week, by the way. Um, what else? I do, I don't think it's only two cars. I think right away it's three. And the mailbox, I know it's not on the outside as a, as a multi unit. You know, those when you have a front door glass and then you go inside, there's a foyer. So the three mailboxes inside the little foyer piece. And then there's another door that leads to inside the, the unit. As far as the garage not being used, I, I think that's irrelevant because I was not, you know, if the previous owner didn't want to use the garage, that's up to them. I can guarantee you that now it will be used. Uh, by the way, the garage has been fully fixed on the inside. It does not have the gates yet, again, because the house is big, right? So there's a plywood block in the garage. But the inside of the garage, all new joists was replaced a few couple months ago. And uh, also the roof on the garage is fully new. Um, I think that's it. I... Okay, any uh, questions from the board for Mr. Moran? I'm sorry, Mr. Moran. Just, uh, just in looking at the C at the MFD inspection reports and DHCD's database, the last time an MFD inspector was out was 2008. Okay, I think. I think that, that's uh, if you're no questions from the board. I think we can wrap up for tonight. Okay. Uh, we'll call the uh, next case, case number 2021-035, 2021-035-2806 East Baltimore Street. Uh, the applicant is Mr. Adam Corballo, and this is a request to construct a fourth floor addition with a rooftop deck. I'll hear any reports from the end. 
Ms. Mining French. department has no comment on this application. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. French. Okay, so the variance requested here, it's um, basically conditional use pursuant to the code, building height up to 45 feet allowed for an interior row house adjoining the right of way of at least 30 feet wide. Um, the application is to construct a fourth floor addition with a rooftop deck. We have 10 letters of opposition in the record. Um, so I'm happy to, to do those now, or if you want me to wait um, to read those until after Mr. Carbello moves forward. And I know we have people on the call um, who also wish to testify. Okay, we can go ahead with uh, Mr. Carbello. Okay. okay. Um, if I could uh, share my presentation. Certainly. There you go. Um, sorry, I thought I was going to sneeze. Um, okay, so we're um, presenting 2806 East Baltimore Street. This is on the northeast corner of Patterson Park on the, um, on, on the west side of Linwood. And this is an existing three story middle of group. Um, it is in a block of three story middle of group. Um, as Ms. Kathleen mentioned, uh, we're here for a conditional use for a fourth floor penthouse. Um, the property is going to be an owner occupied single family house. Uh, they are requesting a fourth level penthouse as well as a roof deck. The roof deck would be um, on the roof of the third floor. Uh, we don't. Per we don't um, propose any rooftop deck on top of the penthouse. Uh, we did meet with the community or members of the community on Friday, March 26th, uh, and uh, heard their concerns, which I'm sure have been documented through letters. Um, their primary concern was the rear addition that we're proposing. However, that rear addition as a is being provided as a matter of right. We're we're not actually here to discuss that or any type of variance relief. Um, again, as reiterated, um, a a conditional use is permissible on an interior lot that adjoins a street right away of 30, 30 feet. Uh, East Baltimore Street is a uh, right of way of at least thirty feet in this area. Um, as you can see, this is our subject property um, uh, in the mid block between North Serper um, and uh, North Kenwood Avenue. The properties behind run perpendicular to our block and there is a alley street at the rear. Um, specifically, um, our, uh, the, the owner would like to provide a rooftop deck at the front facing the park, a penthouse that is set 21 feet, four inches back from the cornice line, um, and then a, um, uh, a, a modest balcony really for access to uh, condensing units at the back. Uh, some of the feedback that we received from the neighbor, uh, the adjoining neighbors uh, were that they did not wanna see a, a um, the third floor addition with the penthouse all the way at the back. We actually reduced the size of the penthouse after that meeting uh, so that there wouldn't be as much bulk at the rear of the property, uh, which is the north side of the of the site, which um, does not receive any, you know, direct uh, direct sunlight from the south. It receives northern light. Um, so nevertheless, we did cut back the scale of the penthouse by six feet. Um, uh, we also um so you can kind of see that there uh see this in our proposed plans for this the third floor as well as the fourth floor uh the penthouse would just be a large um uh room with a half bathroom um a a, a wet bar and uh, sort of a seating area with a deck on the front of the building set back appropriately uh facing the park um that's some elevations and as well as a building section. So the penthouse would be the center center portion here that we did uh, cut back from the front. Um, the roof deck and the um, the roof deck also has the appropriate setback from the front corner slot on of eight feet um, as as required by planning and zoning. Um, 
we did again in in context we see that our property is located mid block here um the adjoining neighbor actually has a penthouse uh one of our fiercest oppositions is actually from the this neighbor um uh, even though they have a fourth floor penthouse already, as well as a roof deck. Uh, unfortunately, when they built their penthouse and roof deck, they're, they placed their roof deck on the rear of the property that does not have a view of the, of the, of the, um, of the park. Uh, one reason why they're so opposed to this is that when we build the penthouse, it will block his view of the park. Um, unfortunately, they, this uh, adjoining owner probably should have put their roof deck on the front of the house rather than the back. Um, unfortunately, that should not handicap my uh, my client um, from providing their own penthouse. Um, we've looked, um, you know, as you can see here, um, our penthouse would be set much further back, 21 feet, 4 inches from the front, um, much further back than this existing penthouse. And as you can see from Baltimore Street, um, there is no vis visible impact uh, from the street. Um, to the penthouse. Uh, we also did a sun study um, at both different times of year, different times of day. We did not see any negative impact of this of, of the fourth floor. Um, again, being that this is pushed to the you know nearly the back of the property on the north side of the building, it does not receive direct light as it would be on the south side. So the shadow impact to adjoining neighbors is going to be is going to be minimal at best. Uh, you can kind of see, you know, in these areas, even sort of 12 p.m. in April, um, you'll have shadow on on the on the owner's property, but not uh, any adjoining. Um, the shadow lines elsewhere would be compatible with uh, shadows that would be expected uh, throughout different times of year, different times of day. Um, we also looked at um, ex other examples of fourth floor penthouses. There's numerous examples of this around the park. Um, uh, our property is located up here on the north northeast corner, uh, on the southeast southwest corner at 2307 Eastern Avenue. There is a a fourth floor penthouse structure with a roof deck at the front and back, very similar to to what we're proposing. Um, there is a recently approved one also at 2311 Eastern Avenue, two doors down from the structure. Um, there's an additional one at 505 South Milton Street, again, with a middle of, um, you know, a, a middle of group property with a fourth floor uh, penthouse with a roof deck on the front and rear. There's another one at uh, uh, 2420 Fleet Street, again, a fourth floor uh, penthouse. Uh, set back from from the from the front of the property with a with a roof deck at the front and rear. Um, there's another one on East Baltimore Street. Excuse me, 2240 East Baltimore Street. Again, a fourth floor penthouse with a roof deck on the front and rear. Um, another one at 2225 Bank Street. Uh, again, the same same uh, composition. And finally, uh, these are a little further away from from. Uh, uh, Patterson Park, but bears mentioning that the 600 block of South Chester Street, there are uh, five new construction uh, homes with a fourth floor penthouse um, that, you know, compromises the majority of the roof line. Um, and that is our presentation. Okay. All right. I'll pop back. Um, the ball from you, Mr. Carmelo. Certainly. Okay, so um, is there anybody else that you have before I jump into the opposition letters, sir? Uh, no, ma'am. All right, Mr. Fields, you want me to, to go through the letters and then um, work through the testimony? Yeah, if we could. And, and also, not an admission, but uh, just a request for those who will be speaking and testifying that uh, to the extent uh, we have, we understand the, the basis of your opposition through the letters, uh, there's no need to repeat or duplicate in your testimony what's already been presented in the letters. Um, so uh, anything new or in addition uh, that uh, new from you, 
happy to hear it, but with that, go ahead. Uh, we'll okay. Um, first letter is from Francesca Galducci at 2814 East Baltimore Street. Um, she is in opposition to the appeal. Um, she basically says 2800 block of East Baltimore Street currently conform to active building height without variances. Similar design features have been originally designed and developed with unified features, heights, and detail. Um, all of the lot sizes 2800 block are identical as well. There's nothing apparently unique about the particular physical surrounding shape or topography of 2806 East Baltimore. That would cause an unnecessary hardship or practical difficulty for maintaining the building height limitation was strictly applied. 2806 is the same height as every other house in the block. Maximum 3,500 height limitation generally applicable to all of the houses on this block. Um, next one, Allison and Matthew Blood at 2818 East Baltimore Street. They're writing in opposition, um, which seeks the variance for the construction of the fourth floor addition, which will result in the building height in excess of 35 foot maximum. So basically says pretty much the same thing. Um, 2800 block of East Baltimore currently confirmed a maximum building height of 35 feet. All of lot sizes in the 2800 block are identical as well. So nothing apparently unique about the particular physical surrounding shape or type of or conditions. Um, let's see, and they concur with the opposition for Patterson Park Neighborhood Association. Uh, next one is a letter from Jennifer Mann, Mark Tuff, and Jennifer Marsh, all three signed together. Um, they cite the variance approval standards in 5-308 of the zoning code. Um, let's see, contingent on finding physical surrounding shape, topography conditions, and specific structure or land present, an unnecessary hardship or practical difficulty beyond mere inconvenience. Um, let's see, with planned as we acknowledge permitted intent to add roughly 280 feet of new livable space. But, um, let's see. Uh, in a second third story dump out over the kitchen roof and also though adding livable space in the basement through excavation the home is poised to likely enter the top one percent in neighborhood for interior space even before um, the adding the fourth floor this is a and this is in your packet this is a three-page single space letter identifying um issues related to the construction, again, citing 5-308B3, 5-308B4, 5-308B2, and B1. All of these center around the granting of a variance. Um, and they are again, in conclusion, they, we, the immediate neighbors are excited about the renovation and re-inhabitants of 2806. Um, but we disagree with the scope, which is reasonable for the fourth floor development based on the reasons they identify in the letter. Uh, next one is from Anita Pilch. She's a resident of Upper Fells Point. Um, let's see. She's opposed to the variance as massing scale and character would not fit in with the smallest two story row homes that line the block and would overpower neighboring houses and destroy the historic charm. Um, let's see, lack of accurate information from the developer. Um, actually, this one, I take that back. Miss Pelt is not before this one. She's on 45. She ended up in here. This is a totally different one. So we only have nine letters in opposition, not 10. So the strike everything for Miss Pilch. Next one, Frederick J. Schmidt, 2816 East Baltimore Street. Again, cites the same thing. Um, Article 32, Section 5-301. Again, citing the variance uh, procedure to afford a property or relief. You need unnecessary hardship or practical, practical difficulty. And they identify all of the units on the 2800 block of um, East Baltimore Street being the same height. Again, cites the same thing as far as variance um, that the prior letter did, Section 5 308 approval standards and hardship. Um, let's see. Peel fails seven of the seven required findings for approval. The next one is from Lori Nicole. Uh, let's see. Thank <laughs> you. 
<clears throat> she lives at 2012. Concerns regarding the proposed renovations. Um, I do not accurately depict some of the important relevant information. Um, then we have a letter from Councilman Z. Cohen writing in regard to this particular appeal. Past couple of weeks, he's been contacted by multiple residents of 2800 block of East Baltimore Street, leaders of Patterson Park neighborhood. Um, let's see, to voice their opposition, community members are concerned that it will negatively impact the aesthetics on the block, which all other buildings are three stories. Lack of precedent for fourth story addition and comparable properties in the area highlighted the opposition letter from Patterson Park. He supports Patterson Park and other concerned neighbors, which is why he is in opposition. Next letter, Michael Hartenstein. Um, same thing, uh, worried about the view um, and doesn't believe that the legal threshold is met for a variance regarding unnecessary hardship, practical difficulty. And let's see, next one is Daniel and Tracy Wright. They are in opposed as well, basically significantly adding the fourth floor will change the visual appearance of the block of our homes that a precedent for other homeowners do the same. They propose variance goes against the intent of the historical architectural preservation. And they, oh, let's see, it will forever inversely impact their life, their home in sunlight. And I think that was all of them. I think I got just got through all of them. So let's go to anyone else here who is on the call for this particular property. Okay, we have Miss Mann who is raising her hand. So Miss Mann, I'm unmuted you. You can go ahead and speak. Um, most of my opposition was in our letter, but I do want to say that you know we do not have a penthouse. We have a doghouse on our roof. It is very small. It literally is big enough to have access out to the roof. And so it was misrepresented in size. It's only like nine feet by seven feet. It is not livable space. And so I am I just want to make sure it's very clear that there's not already a penthouse on this block. It's roof access. And um and I'll leave leave it to my husband to talk about the rest of it. Okay. Um all right, Miss Mann, and that it would be Mr. Tuff. All right. So, Mr. Mr. Tuff, you are unmuted. Hi there, thank you. Let me just start video here. Oh, uh, no video. Oh, I'm hold on. I can I can move you to a panelist. Go ahead. Okay. Do you have me? Yes. Hi there. Okay, I got it. All right. Thank you. Yeah, I'll keep it brief. Obviously, the letters were fairly extensive in terms of being from eight of the 10 residents of the block, uh, the community association and councilman Cohen. I wanted to just speak brief, just reinforce maybe one thing from the letters and just talk about one substantial inaccuracy that was present in Adam's drawings in the prior meeting. That remains present. And so just let me address that first briefly because that's a material error. Uh, in his drawing that he shows, shows our penthouse structure as being, I took an iPhone picture of it, roughly 20 by 14 feet. It is in fact six feet eight inches by nine feet five inches. That was seen in our prior meeting in March. That was discussed. Pat Lundberg, who is our housing chair, who is an architect, asked him if he could make sure that he updated that drawing for purposes of this meeting. I don't recall his response, but what I'm noting is the drawing representation of 2808 is grossly an error. It's about 500% larger structure shown than what is real. And additionally, the homes on Streeper and Kenwood are labeled as three-story houses when they are in fact two-story houses. So at a minimum, at a minimum, that representation of our home should be accurate, we think. Additionally, with respect to Adam's comments, and, and we should, I do want to say, because what I really wanted to start out my comments with saying is we're thrilled that someone has bought the house. We're thrilled someone is investing in it. We understand the other bump outs, the other, the other investments were committed, and we're glad someone has confidence in the neighborhood. It's just the livable space on the fourth floor that we object to. So having said that, to go back to our deck for just a moment, 
Uh, our park view is not an issue. We have a strip of deck on the front of our doghouse that has an unobstructed view of the park. Our, our issue in general here is twofold, and I'm speaking, I think, for the whole block here. Um, in our neighborhood, and, and you may not make decisions predicated on neighborhood, you make them predicated on code, and, and we understand that, but I worked for the Patterson Park CDC and did about 400 rehab architect homes in the neighborhood, so the long vested interest. Um, in a neighborhood of Patterson Park, roughly bounded by the park, Patterson Park Avenue, Orleans, Highland, and Lombard, uh, we have zero livable space, fourth floor extensions, additions to three-story building, none. We fear the prospect of a sort of sawtooth on the park where we have canyons surround, you know, one house with fourth floors on two sides of it, taking the views from decks that may already exist on neighboring buildings. That's, those, those are the two cruxes of what we're opposed to as a whole. We, we already have four decks on the half block and this will include this will include sunset and sunrise views for some of those decks. Um, and we currently have no properties whatsoever with livable space on the park. Our, our, we have a cap on our stairs to the top with a code required landing of about 30 inches. And as I said, overall, it's six feet eight by nine feet five. There are many such instances, it is true, of, of basically head houses on stairs for deck access. But there's zero instances among 8,000 houses in the neighborhood of movable space for the floors. We believe, per the letters, that the, the other hinges being made to the house are already going to put it at a square footage that's in the top 1% in the neighborhood, provides plenty of room. We welcome a rooftop deck. We welcome the fact that that might include an access hut. We don't really welcome 24 foot unprecedented livable space on that. So that's, that's basically where we, we are with this in lockstep with the councilman and with the neighborhood. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you, Mr. And I think we have one more, um, one more person on the line. And that's Miss. Ms. Blood? Uh, yes, nothing new to add, just um, support the you know, same sentiment from the letter and uh, from our assessment just now. Okay. Great, it looks like we have one call in user. I'll go through that. Um, if you're here to speak on this particular appeal, please speak when you hear two beeps. No. All right. So seeing no other hands raised, nothing in. Okay. Oh, Lori. All right. So I have something in the chat that Lori is with you and has one comment. Okay. Um, Mr. Tuff, I'll put you back in. All right. For Lori Nicole. Thank you. Um, I had a question. Can you clarify what the standard is? The notice of appeal says conditional use, use, no variance, yes. So our letters were tailored towards that standard, but the architect used the term conditional use. So what is the standard? Because we relied on the notice of appeal. So what it is, is the way the code reads, it says a height of higher than 35 feet up to a maximum of 45 feet may only be allowed by the zoning board as a conditional use for one, a row house located on interior lot that adjoins a street right of way of at least 30 feet wide, or two, a row house located on a corner lot at which each of the adjoining streets of right of way are at least 30 feet wide. So, go ahead. It is a conditional use, but it is not a variance so based on how the, the. Sorry, why did the notice of appeal not indicate that? Let's see. Conditional use, no. Variance, yes. This is one of the, the footnotes in the code where 
it looks like a variance, but it's not a variance. It's actually a conditional use to height within the code. So I, I can't tell you why it said variance. Okay, thank you. All right. Yeah, uh, in opposition. Let me see. I'm looking for comments and I don't see any other comments. I don't see any other hand raised. The one phone person did not speak up. Um, so I don't think we have any additional opposition. Is Mr. Tuff still okay. there? Uh, yes, he is. I can put him back in. All right, Mr. Tuff, you're back in as a panelist. Hello. Miss, Mr. Tuff? Yeah. Hey, Adam. Um, how do you describe... Oh, sorry, not Adam. Sorry. Go ahead. How do you describe a livable space? Uh, I mean, personally, I describe livable space as something other than hallway ingress or egress. I don't know if that maps to a formal definition that's relevant for you. Uh, but for instance, in our case, in every case I'm aware of, uh, you know, an architect or a designer says, we're going to put a roof on top of stairs. And when we get to the top of the stairs, code specifies a certain landing space. Um, and most of the structures, I'm not saying all, but certainly most of the structures I'm aware of within our neighborhood, Patterson Park, uh, are of that nature. Um, there aren't couches in them, there aren't chairs in them, there aren't dance floors in them, there aren't pinball machines in them, there aren't saunas in them. They are, they are essentially a hallway, they're a capstone over stairs, either linear or in our case spiral, and then they're a small landing as required by code. We would make ours small if we could. And we still have that south of our dog house. So we have we have an obstructed view that we go away as a park. Again, that, that's how I would describe livable um, Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Off the top of your head, uh, Ms. Byrne, are you aware if there's a definition of livable space in the code? Let's see. Simon's talking to me. Um, there is in the building code, uh, Mr. Top. Um, let's see. Okay, good. You're muted. So, 15. Livable space is defined in um, in both the building code, and I believe I don't think it's necessarily defined in the zoning code. And generally, it has to do with height of your, and Mr. Carbella could probably even comment on this. I believe it has to do with with build with ceiling height, right? Well, if I could respond, I think that this this is an irrelevant distraction because um, we are here for a conditional use for overall building height of up to forty five feet. What is not here for debate, or what here is not for consideration, is whether it's a livable space or not. Whether I'm five square feet or 5,000 square feet, that is not what is being discussed here and weighed in on. What is here is the building height. And um, this discussion of whether it's a livable, a habitable space or whether it's a doghouse or a staircase with a landing is irrelevant to the conversation. And, you know, you can see from the examples we provided, we provided examples of building heights up to 45 feet. Uh, you can call them penthouses, you can call them dog houses. Uh, there is no sort of uh, deviation whether or, or separation between whether it's habitable space or not. And that is not what the request is, and that's not what, in the, what is in the zoning code. So I asked an improper question? Sorry, sir. So I asked an improper question, you're saying? Well, it's well. That, that is what um, some of the adjoining neighbors are using as evidence for why this should, why they don't, you know, support this this appeal. But the appeal is for conditional use, which uh, I might add also has a lesser threshold than a true variance. Um, 
you know, uh, so any, any, any request for hardship or unusual lot size or shape or so forth is not the minimum threshold for a conditional use. That is the minimum threshold for a variance. Uh, however, we've shown through data, through photographs of numerous other examples around the park, including our next door neighbor, uh, and whether or not the next door neighbor, Mr. Tuff, has a usable penthouse or a livable space, he's still violating the height. I would still, and whether my proposed penthouse was 500 square feet or five square feet, I would still need to be here in front of the board to request conditional use for that 45 feet. Um, it, it's irrelevant to the amount of space that, that I, I'm creating at the top uh, as per the zoning code. Katie, if I can jump in real quick, the the applicable section I think is uh, fifteen three hundred one measure, and it's that that pertains to how building height is measured, and there's a lot of exclusions in sec subsection B, which includes and houses and roof decks, um, so those aren't considered when calculating building height. Thanks, Simon. So in looking at, um, and it is it is tricky. So Mr. Carbell is 100% right. This is a conditional use. This is not a variance request. And I just looked up the posting notice and it was the only thing in the posting notice was construct a fourth floor addition with rooftop deck. And uh, I believe, based on my own understanding and review of the code, that Mr. Carbello is accurate that the threshold for conditional use uh, is certainly less than what the parent what it is for variance, but for purposes of the record, uh, the conditional use, what is it that must be shown? Right. Um, maybe, um, Mr. French, not to put you on the spot, but I'm putting you on the spot um, because this is a section of the of the zoning code where it's literally a footnote that references conditional use, not variance standard. Correct. The zoning code, as written, made this extra height above 35 feet is something that the board could approve using the standards for a conditional use. Uh, it is true that ordinarily anything going above a certain height is considered a variance required, but in this particular situation, the code makes the additional height up to 45 feet, something the board can approve under the standards and procedures for conditional use. If the applicant had been asking for 50 feet, for example, rather than 45, that would have been a variance. But the applicant is only asking for up to 45 feet, which is within the board's purview as a conditional use decision. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Frank. Um, Mr. Carballo, is there anything else you'd like to add, uh, either in response to or? Um, I, I don't believe I have anything additional to add that that has already been presented. Um, I, I think we've we've outlined our case. We've shown examples, and I've shown that we've we meet the requirement for conditional use up to forty five feet. Okay. Thank you, sir, for your presentation. Thank you. Uh, that. Uh, All right. Twenty twenty one dash o thirty five. We'll go to case number 2021-044-2312 Avenue. The applicant is Rick Development LLC, Bertram Stewart, and this is a request to use the premises as a multi-family dwelling that will consist of three dwelling units. I'll hear any reports. 
Correct. Um, for staff report, the request is a minimum lot area of 4,000. 500 square feet is required, only 2,890 square feet is available, um, and there is a request for off-street parking variance of 100%, three spaces required, none proposed. The research that staff conducted was the property was reduced from a multifamily dwelling to a single family dwelling in 1998. So the issue that the board has is that it doesn't have the authority to convert a single family to a multifamily in an R6 zone. Um, I do not, Mr. French, did planning comments on this one? Yes, thank you. Planning department reviewed this application. Uh, the information available to the department was that it was last authorized for use as a single family attached dwelling, which is a permitted use in the R6 district. However, the R6 district is one in which the board is not authorized to approve conversion of a single family dwelling to a multi-family dwelling. And therefore, the Department of Planning recommends disapproval of the application. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. French. Um, if you are here for this particular application for 2312 Anoka Street, I have Rick's Development LLC. I also have a Bertram Stewart. Um, please raise your hand or put in the chat that you would like to speak. I'll also check the one call in user. If you are here and you hear the two beeps, please speak. All right. Uh, I don't see anything in the chat. I don't see an attendee with a hand raise. Simon, check for me as well. All right. So I do not see anyone here for this particular application. All right, um, <laughs> let's give them the benefit of one other matter. Do we, okay. Guess, class matter and then we'll, uh, we'll um, Okay. So in the meantime, we'll move on to case number 2021-056, 1542 North Broadway. The applicant is Abilicus Lawal. This is a request to use the ground floor as offices for a behavioral health center. I'll hear any staff reports you may have. Mr. French, would you like to go first? Mm, all right, thank you. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> planning department received this application and reviewed it. Noted that this property is located in the Oliver NDP Urban Renewal Plan area, and the proposed use would not be prohibited or restricted by that particular urban renewal plan. However, it does contain provisions regulating exterior changes to properties, and the applicant should refer to that before undertaking any physical changes to the existing structure. With regard to the use itself, uh, this application is to be considered under the uh, category of neighborhood commercial establishment. And the description of the proposed use, and we quote, the street level of the property will be used for behavioral health center. The center will consist in finding homes for people, assisting with employments, case managements, counseling services, PRP for adults and children, on-site therapist, end quote. And planning investigated what PRP stood for, and apparently it stands for Psychiatric Rehabilitation Program. So it's planning department's belief that the first two activities can be accomplished in an office, which is a type of neighborhood commercial establishment. But the next activities perhaps could be grouped more appropriately as the category of healthcare clinic, which is defined in the zoning code as a facility for the examination and treatment of individuals on an outpatient basis by one or more physicians, dentists, chiropractors, physical therapists, or other licensed healthcare practitioners. And a healthcare clinic is not listed as a use allowed under the neighborhood commercial establishment category. So, use of the first floor offices, uh, use first floor as offices for persons assisting with home finding or employment finding could be approved at this location. The department therefore has no objection to approval of use of the first floor portion of the premises as an office. If that is a type of neighborhood commercial establishment, which the board may authorize. The Department of Planning recommends disapproval of the portion of this application that the board may determine to be associated with a healthcare clinic. It is not a type of neighborhood commercial establishment as set forth in the zoning code. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fred. 
staff report is very similar to it, it appears there are two different requests here one as a neighborhood commercial establishment as an office and the other as a health care clinic the board does not have the legal authority to grant the use of a health care clinic it can only grant the use of an office and things related to that office anything with behavioral health or any other kind of health related activity um, is deemed a health care clinic under the code the property was last used as a personal services establishment. I have um, Bilkis Law, who is the applicant, and I will elevate him to a panelist. Hello. Hello, good afternoon, ma'am. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, uh, ma'am. Uh, so we're here on your application. Uh, as stated in your application, to use the ground floor as offices for behavioral health center. Yes, sir. Uh, were, were you, could you hear uh, the presentation of uh, the statements of Mr. French from planning? Yes, I had him. Okay. Uh, what is your intention uh, with regard to the use of the space in the building? Yeah, the intention is to connect them with the resources to help them meet their needs, like on them, like employment, benefit services, program and service for, for community. That is the reason we're trying to use the place for. Well, tell us specifically what you're intending to put, to, what activities you're intending to conduct. It's to help the community. Ma'am, tell me what activities you're going to do to help the community. Yeah, I mean, for the Behavioral Science Center. I'm just sorry? to make, we're trying to use the place for Behavioral Science Health Center. Behavioral Science Health Center. Behavioral Health Center. That's what I mean. Okay. Well, um, one, what Mr. French stated, and what Ms. Byrne reiterated, is that the code does not allow this board to authorize uh, any health care at that location. It could be used as an office. <laughs> for the various things that were stated in the application, like helping people find a job or other various office uses. But if you're contending to use it as a behavioral health center, that is not allowed. That's why I asked if you heard what Mr. French had stated. Yes, I heard him. So in that case, we have to take the PRP off, the, off it. Well, you need to tell us what exactly you're intending to do, and how you're amending your application. Yeah, we're trying to use the place to get for the unemployment, to get people to benefit from our service, like unemployment. Um, sort of, so. Okay. Yeah, for the PRP program, we're going to take the PRP program off it. Okay. Uh, the PRP, does that, is that the only health care? Yes, that's the only health care that's pertaining to the mental health. We take that one off it. Then we just use it for the unemployment and also other medical assistance services. Okay, uh, so you're you're intending to use it only as an office. Yes, sir. Office related uses, no health care whatsoever. Yes, sir. Uh, what are your intended hours? Uh, well, yeah, Monday to Friday, eight to six, and Saturday and Sunday, ten to six. Okay. Any questions from the board? No. <clears throat> Is there anything else you'd like to add, ma'am? No, that's about it, sir. 
Very well. So, just to be just to be clear, ma'am, you will not have an on-site therapist, correct? It's just going to be housing and unemployment. Okay. Well, I'm asking. Okay. That, that asking. Correct? <laughs> I do have a question. I also. Sure. Go ahead. Ms. Lowell, how will how will the taking away of the PRB change what you're going to do? If the board does grant this, what will, what will change about your plan? The only thing that's going to be changed is just the PRP program. We're going to take the PRP program off it. Okay, what will you do to take it off? Yeah, we have to get back to the CAF, then restructure it again. That's all. We, we're not going to do anything pertaining to PRP or, or, or therapy. Okay. Okay, very well. Okay. All right. Um, let me, I'm just going to go through and see if there's Anyone uh, call in user if you wish to speak about this matter? See, we still have a few other people's people on the call. If anyone would like to speak on this, please raise your hand or put it in the chat. Great, seeing no hands raised, seeing nothing in the chat. I believe that this is, um, that would conclude the docket. All right, um, let's try uh, one more time with uh, 2021 as 044, uh, 2312 Anoka Avenue. If you are here for Anoka Avenue, um, please raise your hand, put something in the chat. I will also try the call in user again. Mm -hmm. Oh, is Roxana on with them? All right, Roxana might be on with them. Let's see if the call in user is. Okay. All right, it seems that they are getting ready to call in right now. So let's, we'll give them, I guess, two minutes. Okay, sure. To call in. All right, let me see if something pops up here. All right, I still only have nine attendees. All right, here we go. Looks like we got a new one. Hi, are you here for 2312 Anoka? Yes, I am. Okay. What is your name, ma'am? My name is Barbara Brown. On behalf okay. of, of, of Rick. Are you here in support of or in opposition to 2312 Anoka? Um, 2312 Anoka. Are you here in support of the project or in opposition to it? Oh, I'm in support. <laughs> okay. Uh, go ahead. Tell us about your support. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm making an appeal that they change the um the property from a, a one family dwelling to a two family dwelling, and I'm hoping that they can approve that. Wait a minute. Okay. So let's back up a second. <laughs> You're supporting something that is not yet been presented. So we're still trying to hold on. We're still trying to find Bertram Stewart or anybody from Rick's Development LLC. I'm from Rick's Development LLC. I'm sorry. I'm representing Rick's Development LLC. 
Okay, so what is the request here? Three dwelling units or two? Um, two. Ms. Byrne, is the application state three? The application actually states three. Okay, the application states three, but I was told that um, y'all wouldn't approve a three. So if y'all won't approve a three, we'll take a two. Huh. Well, uh, actually, we may not approve a two if this is a <laughs> if we can only grant approvals for single family dwelling. Um, well, the thing is, the the house, if you look at the house, the house should be split up where you can have two families in there. Um, it's a first floor and then it's a second floor. And then down in the basement, there's a whole another unit, um, which could be another family. But, okay, um, let me let me the, let me just stop you. Let me just stop you for a second. We need to just get some confirmed some fact here in the history of this, uh, Miss Byrne. Um, sure. Me, our, our records reflect that this property was reduced from a multifamily dwelling to a single family dwelling in 1998. Correct. And, and what's that based upon? Um, it actually was a reduction. It was a request from the reduction. Let's see. Da, da, da. We have a zoning card that it actually was a request that was made in 1998, where the it was an application was filed to reduce from two dwelling units to one dwelling unit with kitchen facilities removed from the second floor, and that was August 28th, 1998, and it was an appeal filed with the BMZA, and that was approved. Okay, so, so from okay. 1998, hold on, ma'am. So from 1998, our records reflect from 1998 to the present. This has been a single family home. Okay. But, a single um, family Rick, home. Okay. Rich development um, bought the property. Um, bought it as when, a single man? dwelling. Okay. Um, he bought the property in, I think, 2013. Okay. And he did work on it and he made it he made it back into a two-family dwelling um the second floor is really like a whole apartment it has a bathroom it has a, a kitchen it has a living room and it has a bedroom um the first floor is also has a kitchen and a bathroom and and one bedroom so really the second floor is like a whole apartment and the, and the first floor is like a whole apartment um and what he wants to do is change it back to a two-family dwelling. Hello? Uh, our records reflect that this was lawfully a, a single-family dwelling. We don't no, have anything. Ma'am, let me finish. I don't believe we have any. Go ahead, Ms. Byrne. Tell us about the history of this so, property and where we are and what we need to share. So, ma'am. In 1998, it was two families, and um, the owner from 2013 might have done construction to convert it to a multifamily dwelling, but this board doesn't have the legal authority to convert it from a single family back to a multifamily. So he might want to do that, but the board doesn't have the ability to grant him that use because in 1998 it was reduced from two to one and the board can't back that out and since 1998 the there's been are you able to do it for a three bedroom a three no ma'am you're going even higher hang on hang on one second miss Byrne. Mm -hmm. 1998 it was it was reduced from a multifamily to a single family Correct. and since that time there's been nothing lawfully done to increase the units to make it a multifamily dwelling correct correct all right do you understand well, that ma'am did did okay but did y'all get the drawing um what proof do you need that it, it's been converted back to a two dwelling well, ma'am, you can do all you, you can do many things uh, inside a property, but it has to be lawfully done. And so, uh, if our, what is the step to lawfully do it? 
Ms. Byrne. I, I'm new at this. So, so, so here's the, here's the, here, well, ma'am, here's the problem. You, you have no recourse to make this two families and you can't make it three families. It can only be one family. So no matter what construction permits that you pull to put multiple kitchens or multiple bathrooms in there, the zoning code says that you're in an R6 zone, that the prior zoning history for this was someone actually went to the effort to reduce it from two dwelling units to one dwelling unit. And the board cannot undo that. No one can undo that. And that's despite someone going in making changes to create a whole second floor apartment or anything like that it doesn't change the legal nature of it from a single family to a multifamily because someone went in and changed it on their own and presently okay, so presently it can't be changed because you can't convert a single family to a multifamily where that house is situated Okay, so if 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 I had to rent that house, I can only rent it out to one family. It's a single family dwelling. That's correct. And it's nothing that we can do with zoning or or anything. No, zoning is clear. You can't convert a single family to a multifamily, which is appears to be what you're trying to do. Yeah. Um. So is all the houses in that neighborhood a single family? Don't know. But if you have a single family in an R6, you cannot convert it to a multifamily today. Today. Um, and you can't tell me, well, you're saying that there's no way, there's no procedure or nothing that I can present to try to get them to change it. No, because the zoning code states that you can't do it. It doesn't allow it. Okay, so what what can we do with the what can we do with the property? Use it as a single family dwelling. It's a single family dwelling. You're free to do with it what you wish. It's a single family dwelling. Okay, so do we have to take so we we can still keep the two kitchens in the house? Um, we actually, ma'am, we, we're not in a position to give you that kind of advice. Um, this is something that you're going to have to take up with either a, um, a building inspector or someone in the zoning administrator's office. Okay. So, um, so what do I tell, um, Mr. Stewart that, it has to, um, if we rent out that property, we only can rent it to one family. Is that what you're saying? Mr. Stewart, that his application requesting three units cannot be granted. It can't be granted for two. Okay. So it, the property has to remain as a single. Correct. Yeah. Okay. And it's nothing we can do about it. <laughs> Correct. Okay. I'll I'll I'll, I'll relay that message. There's nothing I can do. There's nothing I can do. I thought with us sending the drawing in, and they could see how it laid out that they were granted, but. No, it's an issue. Of, it's an issue of what the code says and what the code allows. The code code won't allow what Mr. Seward seeks to do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. That will conclude uh, today's docket, and I guess we can proceed to the liberation portion. Uh, we can take a, a timely break uh, if anybody would like that. Um, <laughs> uh, you know what? If, could we take a, a you know at least a three minute break, maybe a five minute one? So I got to take care of it. I like it. How about three o'clock? All right, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you.